I like that opening music. Freedom, freedom from religion. Who says all the Christians have all the good music, right? That's right. Hi, welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I'm Ryan Jane. I'm a constitutional attorney here at FFRF. And today we're going to be talking about FFRF's other major video effort, a program that we've been doing for about three years now yeah. uh, called Free Thought Matters. But before we get into that, I want to mention that if you've got any questions or comments for us, post them right here on Facebook, or you can send an email to askanatheist at FFRF.org. So there's some lines missing, but um, <laughs> you're right, we do have a... Um, regular TV show, besides Ask an Atheist, which is live right now, we have this TV show that broadcasts in, uh, I think, about a dozen cities around the country. Seattle, um, D.C., Chicago, Houston, and other places. You can see them on the screen there. Sacramento, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And Free Thought Matters is a half-hour show that um, interviews interesting guests and uh, has music and activism and state church separation. And if I remember right, it covers about 30 percent of the country's population. Or 22 or 20, 25 percent. 25, uh, about a quarter. Okay, okay. So, so check your local listings. You, you may have access to it. It's a, a good, uh, good chance. But you've had some, uh, some really fantastic people on, on the show over the years. Well, we've had uh, comedians like uh, Julia Sweeney and Leanne Lord and uh, Trey Crowder. Right, the liberal redneck. The liberal redneck. Uh, we, we've had uh, uh, authors, um, Phil Zuckerman. Uh, we've had uh, Larry Kramnick and uh, we've had uh, actors. Um, John Delancey has been on the show. Uh, and Ed Asner was in here. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Too bad we couldn't have had Ed Asner on this, Ask an Atheist. That would have been it. He was so funny. He came in just sort of at the last minute. He's 90 years old. You know, he played Lou Grant mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. the Mary Tyler Moore show. And he, um, he, he played Up. You know, kids, that's right. Well, yeah, yeah. Not, kids of all ages like that movie. Oh, up, yeah. Up, uh, where he played that. And Ed Asner has played um, Santa a number of times. And he's also played God a few times. <laughs> and he sat in this chair, and when he heard Annie Laurie's name, Annie Laurie Gaylor, his co-president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, uh, he said, oh, your name's Annie Laurie. So he sang to her the song, the Scottish ballad, yeah. Annie Laurie. I played that on the piano yesterday. Oh, you did? Yep. It was open on the, on the piano, so I just sat down and plunked it out. So Ryan is, is uh, one of our attorneys here, but he's also a, a pianist. And many times during lunch, you're up there playing mostly classical, right? That's right, yes. And so the, and the, the uh, Steinway that we have at the building is just an incredible thing that we are uh, so lucky to have. And so this is thanks to uh, Diane Yule that uh, we have, Diane and Stephen Yule, uh, who were incredibly generous, knowing that Dan is a, uh, a professional there's the jazz piano. pianist, of there's course. The piano there, yeah, there. there's a shot of it. So that piano is on the top floor of Free Thought Hall. So that's right, every, every lunch, if I have time, if I don't have pressing deadlines and whatnot, I get to uh, squeeze in some, some music. And you know, I was thinking recently, we can, we're gonna talk a little bit more about music later, but when I was younger, I loved, um, I loved Bach. I really fell in love with Baroque music, but as I get older, I find that I like Beethoven more and more. So uh -huh. I've been playing uh, a lot of Beethoven sonatas, uh, which also I believe, so we had Jared Dunn, uh, on the the show, and we've had him here playing on the the Steinway, and he's played a lot of Beethoven. Jared as well. Dunn is the classical pianist who uh, he's from Canada, but he's played all over the world. He's like a Chopin expert, but he he played Debussy for us. He played uh, Chopin. He played Beethoven. He played the whole. Uh, what's the official name for the Moonlight Sonata? It's uh, one of the sonatas. It's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. C sharp minor sonata. The C yeah. sharp minor. Yeah, he played that whole thing. And to hear it on that piano, and I got to sit next to him on that piano. And uh, so um, apparently... Uh, yeah, so, so another uh, class of uh, interesting guests that we've had on Free Thought Matters are members of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which is one of the great things that has come out of the last few years of FFRF working in Washington, D.C. So these are members of Congress who have joined together as a, uh, a voting block and a thinking group 
called the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. And we've had three members, I believe, of yeah. the caucus on the show. Mark Pocan, who's yeah. our representative here in Madison, Wisconsin, in Dane County area. That's right. Uh, Jamie Raskin, who's from Maryland. Maryland. Mm -hmm. Jamie Raskin is one of the co-chairs with Jared Huffman of California, who's one of the co-chairs. And Bruce, do we have a little clip from that interview with Jared Huffman? The Morning Consult just released a poll that said now 47% of the country sees Christian nationalism as a threat, uh, which is up significantly from before the 2016 election. So whatever you're doing is working, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to, I, I, I can't take <laughs> credit entirely for that. Uh, I think, frankly, the overreaching of people like Donald Trump and others who are so blatantly using religion to advance demagoguery and, and dark agendas. Uh, thankfully, that data suggests that the American people are seeing through it and figuring it out, and that's a good thing. So, and, and you can see that entire interview uh, after we show Free Thought Matters, then we put it up on YouTube. And you can go to YouTube and look for Free Thought Matters, and you can see all, I think there's, what, 80 shows now, including Jared Huffman, Mark Pocan, member of Congress, and uh, Jamie Raskin is also. We had our 42nd annual convention here in Madison last fall. And at that time, we recorded shows with many of the speakers who were at the convention, including the new president of Americans United. That's a group that works for separation of church and state, Rachel Lazar. Don't you think that most or many or most believers actually support state church separation because it's good for their religion? Absolutely. I mean, even in the, the Bladensburg Cross case that went to the Supreme Court, um, a bunch of Christian groups submitted a friend of the court brief and talked about how it would sully yeah. the cross, which is the most sacred symbol of Christianity, to say that it was a secular symbol, that it, that it actually means that, you know, eternal life for believers and that it shouldn't be... Um, communicated that it's something secular represents all the dead. Yeah, yeah and uh, Rachel was a, a brilliant speaker as well at our at our convention, and that uh, speech I believe is also available at our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, another author that was on uh, Free Thought Matters is the respected ac academic Anthony Pinn who accepted FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award at last year's FFRF convention. Uh, professor Pinn is a professor of humanities and religion at Rice University, and he's also a prolific humanist author with more than 30 books, including one called Writing God's Obituary. Huh. Uh, what should we be thinking about when it comes to race and religion? Well, Dan, it, it, it's as simple as this, that from my perspective, humanism has an obligation to think in terms of quality of life, to address the issues that prevent communities from living fully. And within the context of the United States, one of those undeniable issues is the issue of race. And it is deeply connected to free thought or humanism, right? So for example, I've not met very many humanists or atheists who don't speak fondly of Thomas Jefferson. But in claiming Thomas Jefferson, humanists and atheists and free thoughts claim a legacy of sexual violence and racism. Especially coming from Virginia, like he did. In Shouldn't we say something about this, right? So it seems to me we have an obligation, if for no other reason to better understand what we claim, we have an obligation to address issues of race. And on another show of Free Thought Matters, Andrew Seidel, who's our director of strategic response, he had the opportunity to interview the hilarious comedian, the liberal redneck, Trey Crowder. One day in spring of 2016, I saw this video that was being shared amongst like people I went to high school with, like hardcore Christian types that I went to high school with, that's how I saw it. But it was going viral amongst that community. It had like 15 million views. And it was a video of some preacher in North Carolina where the transgender bathroom laws were, you know, happening at. That was the fight. And it was just him, he wasn't even trying to be funny, or no jokes anywhere. It was literally just him preaching fire and brimstone into his phone in the woods for some reason, <laughs> standing by his truck, just yelling at his phone about the, the horrors of the the perverts in the bathrooms and all this stuff. And when I saw that, it was I was disgusted by it, but I sure. also 
I, it's like a like a switch flipped or something. I just kind of realized like if this dude is what I'm trying to you know satirize or make fun of, and he this is exactly it, then like I don't need, I don't need to, to be fancy. Camera, I need yeah. to I, I I would be better served doing it exactly the way he d- does it. Just go out back, yell at my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've seen, if you haven't seen uh, Trey Crowder's YouTube stuff where he's yelling at his phone in his backyard, it's absolutely hilarious. Very highly recommended. He had our whole crowd of members just rolling at the, yeah, he was he, the, the closer of our convention. He, yeah, because there's this uh, stereotype that all Southerners are conservative churchgoers, you know, but he said there's a bunch of liberal non-believers down there and they don't get the respect that's due to them, do yep, they? That's right. One mm-hmm. of the nice things about Free Thought Matters, our TV show, is that it's an actual broadcast. Uh, this show we're doing today is a live Facebook Live thing, and I think most of you viewers of this show, you care about the issue, so you're watching because you're, you're kind of part of us. Maybe there's some new, new viewers here today, but with Free Thought Matters, it airs on Sundays in these markets around the country. Anybody can tune in, and we hear from people who say, I never knew about your group, because it's a great way to reach out, not just preaching to the choir. Yeah. And we have a lot more shows coming up. That's right. And you have some special shows coming up that you wanted to discuss today. We, is that right? We've been working really hard. Uh, Bruce Johnson is our very capable director, uh, video director. And uh, he set upstairs the, the, the piano that's upstairs that you play almost every lunchtime and I get to play jazz on. Uh, he set it up as a studio um, with drapery and lights. And uh, we, we're, we're preparing t- four shows Two of them are shows about the Great American Songbook, which are, people would be surprised how many of the songs that we've come to know and love through history were written by non-believers. And there are dozens and dozens of them. So I got to sit at the piano and play some of their music and talk about them. Uh, And uh, Bruce, do we have something from one of those shows to show? Who is this? Uh, Scott Joplin, Joplin. okay. (laughs) Scott Joplin was the king of ragtime, and Scott Joplin was not religious. He never wrote religious music. He was married in a home, not in a church, nor was his funeral conducted in a church. Joplin's early musical career took place in centers of entertainment, not in churches. He played the piano in a brothel and in a club, the famous Maple Leaf Club, that was shut down due to pressure from local churches, whose pastors were ashamed of the, quote, iniquitous practices that were taking place in those establishments. You know what those iniquitous practices were? Dancing. No wonder Joplin rejected the church. Because, as biographer Edwin Berlin notes, the churches rejected what was important to him, ragtime, dance, and the theater. Whatever Joplin's private views may have been, it is clear that his music was not inspired by religion. Scott Joplin wrote a musical, it's called Tremonitia, which was for its day quite feminist with an intelligent female lead and quite irreverent in which he mocks the useless pastor in the musical, whom he calls Reverend All Talk. And he encourages education, not religion, as the solution to the world's problems. So did you know that about Scott Joplin before? uh... Uh, So I only did because I read a biography of his uh, when I, it was the same semester that I actually first interned at FFRF in 2015. I learned a lot because I've always enjoyed Joplin. I like his his music. I've always liked Ragtime. Uh, And actually, I remember reading that um, when he wrote Maple Leaf Rag, it was one of these pieces that he wrote very quickly. It just sort of, you know, a religious person might say it was just, it just came to me. I was channeling it, you know, but obviously not the case with, with Joplin. And when it was done, he said, this is definitely going to be a hit. You know, he could just tell right away, this yeah. is going to be a winner. So. so on these upcoming, this, this show has not aired yet. So you're the first to see a little bit of this show about the great American songbook, but there are, you know, the Gershwins and uh, uh, Jerome Kern and Irving Berlin. And of course, Yip Harburg, the irreverent lyricist and uh, 
Cole Porter. Cole Porter had to come out of two closets, right. you know, in his day. So, uh, and, and many, many others that, uh, it's fascinating. And to prepare for the show, I read about 60 biographies. Wow. You can go in my office and see the big, you know, all these <laughs> fascinating stuff to learn about their personal lives and what went behind these songs. And really it was their love of, of nature. It was their love of humanity. It was human values that motivated most of their music. Although we can't deny that um, religion has motivated some beautiful music. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I often think of there's a, a Tim Minchin lyric where he uh, is talking about going to, to church and he says the, with the music, the chords are nice, but the lyrics are dodgy or spooky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the lyrics are spooky. Yeah, yeah. he talks about that. <laughs> and of course, um, some religious music was actually written by non-religious composers because they were doing a job. One example is uh, Ray Vaughan Williams, mm. the classical uh, British classical composer who wrote some of the hymns that are still being sung in the English hymnal and the Presbyterian hymnal. Wow. He was an atheist when he wrote them, and he said, if you're going to go to church, you may as well hear some good music. <laughs> so, uh, so when are those shows going to air on Free Thought Matters? So uh, the I think March first is the first. Is that right, Bruce? March first is the March first and March eighth with part one and part two of the Great American Songbook. Okay, excellent. And uh, but those two shows aren't all. Uh, don't you have some non-believing uh, classical composers to talk about as well? So yes. Yeah, so then uh, uh, soon after that, we will air two shows with the classical pianist Jared Dunn, who plays everything, you know, Debussy and all that beautiful stuff. And I got to sit next to the piano while he and I, we talked through and he played through a lot of these composers. Uh, uh, not just the outspoken atheists, you know, like Verdi, the opera mm -hmm. composer, and Prokofiev, of course, the, the Soviets, you know, Prokofiev and uh, uh, Shostakovich was the Soviet and Prokofiev, a Russian composer. But uh, Ravel and, um, and um, Berlioz and Brahms, of course. Mm -hmm. And we went, talk a whole lot about Brahms. So those shows are also going to air in, uh, in the future. Excellent. Yeah. And, and Beethoven as well, who we yeah. met before. So we got two out of the three big Bs anyway, between Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we think Bach was probably a devout believer. Uh, I mean, many of them were believers. Dvorak, for example, was a devout Catholic. Dvorak, as a young man, was a friend of Brahms. Brahms was an agnostic humanist, and, and Brahms and Dvorak were talking one day, and Dvorak was shocked. He told a friend of his, Brahms is such a great man, a great composer, a wonderful human being, but he believes in nothing. He <laughs> believes in nothing. How can it be? Because from Dvorak's point of view, music comes from God and, you know, it's inspiration. Yeah. So how can somebody like Brahms write beautiful music without that? Right. Well, it's just like we hear all the time complaints, uh, people who say, well, if you're an atheist, where do you get morals come fr from? How could you possibly act in a moral or ethical way if you don't believe in God? Because to them, their morality comes from a higher source. Yeah. And of course, that's just not the way that we view the world. And so we're walking counterexamples all the time. And all these composers are the same thing. When you, uh, when you look at the people like, like Bach, who maybe did view it that way, where they said, oh, you know, this is, this is me somehow unearthing the divinity of God or something in this beautiful music, but then you get all these non-believers coming and they can write music that's, that's just as, as amazing. Well, I used to be a Christian songwriter and I used to feel that way, like this Holy Spirit, I get goosebumps, you know, and I, and I thought, well, the Lord is speaking through me while I'm doing this music. But now for 30 some years, I've been writing atheistic free thought music and I get the same kind of emotional feeling because music is just music. It's just notes. And I guess our species evolved to relate to, to that in some way. Huh? So, so when you were doing that, would, would you ever, you know, hit, try, try a chord that nowadays you would just say, no, that doesn't work. And do, was there any tension of like, what are you doing up there? That doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I mean, when you're religious, it all frames in, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe I made a mistake, but God's directing me okay. or, or maybe... Maybe it wasn't specific notes, but the general inspiration for the song. And then I had to work out the craft right. on my own kind of thing. So but if there's uh, a mistake, that must be you. That's my mistake. But yeah. the finished product that's perfect, that's God. Of course, I never made mistakes. I always, right, uh, right. You know, I'm still getting royalties 
from some of that early Christian music. Wow. Which is back in the <laughs> 1970s, uh, which is fun. I don't spend it. I, used, I, did, I donate it to charity or, or to the Freedom from Religion Foundation mm -hmm. or something. Hmm. And so how, how far back does that, does that date from? When were you writing those? Well, my first published music was in the 1975, and I had musicals in 76, 78, up into like into the early 80s I had music. So mm -hmm. some of it is still being performed. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I had a question to something I was thinking about. Uh, when I was first at FFRF and we started talking, I remember I asked, because I knew about your kind of journey, you know, you, as you're describing, from uh, being a true believer and a musician and composer to be, being an atheist, but still being a, a musician and a composer. And so I wondered, as a music lover who used to be religious and no longer is, um, how do you approach religious music now, or music that has religious content. If you find a, a song or a piece that has religious lyrics or a, some religious story behind it, does that taint it for you or bother you, or are you able to kind of listen past that? Well, you can ask the same question about secular music, too. I mean, there's some gorgeous music with some lousy lyrics on them, right. religious or, you know what I mean. You know, but uh, the, the music all by itself says something to you, it's, it, you know, despite whatever the lyrics are. I love, for example, uh, Ave Maria, Schubert's version mm -hmm. of Ave Maria. I think that music, by the way, is just a true expression of human yearning. And I mean, we're all human beings on this planet and we have these feelings. And uh, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like when we look at Islamic architecture. You say, wow, isn't that gorgeous? That, look at the, what those Muslim, you know, I mean, that's just amazing human... But we don't believe the ideology. We don't believe the theology of it. So I think with a lot of religious music, Christian music, we can listen to it. Uh, the Hallelujah Chorus, you know, the yeah. Messiah, all of that. Uh, in fact, the man who had the world record for full performances of Handel's Messiah, 176 full performances, orchestra and choir, David Randolph was a lifelong atheist, hmm. but he loved the Messiah because of the feelings. And when he was singing Hallelujah, it could have been any any word there that was a human word to express what it was. And yeah. also, religion has inspired a lot of bad music, too. I mean, some really drone... I, I hate Amazing Grace. For, for some, piece, for some <laughs> That's reason... That's a controversial people, stance. Well, some people love Amazing Grace, and even secular people sing it. But for me, it has this kind of manipulative, droning kind of... You know what I mean? Just to me. Mm -hmm. But I've heard other religious music that I think, wow, okay, that music is pretty amazing. I like Victor Wooten's version of Amer Amazing Grace, just yeah. uh, just solo bass. He, there's no no lyrics anyway, so there's th that angle gets gets taken away. Uh, but well, I can understand the the atheist falling in love with Handel's Messiah. Certainly, when I was in in high school, is when I first heard Bach's um, Mass in B minor, for instance. And I've never been religious, so there was no there was no connection. To, uh, from that angle, I was just listening to it as this is Baroque music, and I heard it and just said, this is really incredible, or at least parts of it. There are some boring parts, but for the most part, <laughs> I was like, you know, this is really powerful stuff. And um, you can understand how if you are in a setting where everything around you is this religious culture, and you're fed this framing that yeah. this music is a, you know, divine communication, that it kind of tracks, that makes sense to you at the moment, and then you're gonna, how are you gonna be talked out of that because it is such good music? It reinforces and it, you know, it emphasizes and gives credibility to all these feelings you have, yes, because music creates a lot of those feelings, and it happens in all religions, and it happens outside of religion too. Music is a bonding, emotional thing. During one of my debates, one of my opponents actually played a song uh, for the audience, he said, I want you to listen to the song, You'll Know God Exists. <laughs> and so that was very unusual. So he played this two-minute tune, and when he was done, I, I got up and I said, well, you know, I listened to that, and I did feel something. I have to, I have to agree with you. I, I heard the dominant seventh resolving to the tonic major chord, <laughs> first going through the secondary, uh, you know, supertonic, with a suspended seventh on it, and then as that release of tension then resolves into the key you're in, it gives you this beautiful emotional, I felt all those things. I didn't feel the Holy Spirit, but I felt <laughs> this music is calculated to bring these emotions out. So, uh, 
Although it is, it is part of the amazing thing about music too that I found in studying it throughout my, my life is that um, that analysis of it. Because I, I think a lot of believers, when they hear that, they would say, well, you're ruining it. You're you know breaking the, the spell of the music when you analyze it like a scientist like that. But one of the great things about music is that that's, that's false, right? I think you would agree with me that the more you analyze it, the more incredible it gets. And you can realize things, you know, that there are certain chord progressions or certain cadences that you yeah. say, oh, this is really gorgeous. And so yeah. then you can start incorporating that into your own playing or your composing, or you'll hear it in another song. You know, when I start hearing, when I realize that I like something in a Beethoven sonata, I might hear a John Denver tune mm. that I suddenly say, hey, that's Beethoven. You know, he's, he, th this is exactly the same trick. That's why it sounds so good, you know. Richard Dawkins wrote about that in his book. He once said that it was his favorite book of all the books he wrote called Unweaving the Rainbow, which when, when the rainbow and when the prism of lights was understood to be electromagnetic waves of various frequencies, that a lot of people said, well, you're taking the majesty and the beauty out of the rainbow. Now right. you're just talking about it as numerical frequencies of radiation. You're unweaving the rainbow. How boring. And Dawkins said, no, it actually adds, like what you're saying, it actually increases our appreciation of the beauty to understand why we have a rainbow in the first place. And I think the same is true with, with music. Yeah, absolutely. And the rainbow is another great example where just like in your debate, when people are, pre a lot of believers are pressed and they're not well versed in apologetics and they're asked, why do you believe in God? How do you convince someone God, God exists? A lot of times the best they can come up with is they say, well, look at a rainbow, look at a sunset. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to them, that's... That, that's the, the extent of it. But uh, yeah, that's the great thing about the natural world that we live in is that there's enough beauty and just layers upon layers of beauty that it makes it worthy of infinite study, of more study than we have time to give it. And trying to assign it to a supernatural agent actually cheapens that, right? Because yeah. it's a cop-out. You just say, oh yeah, it's beautiful. It's because of God. You don't have a mind that's capable of understanding it. So just sit back and enjoy the surface level beauty and leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So do we want to, do we have any questions? Who's yeah, going to do this? Can I'll, you, let me take a look. Do you know how to work that? Uh, just got to, got to let the kid get in there. Huh. So, okay, so we do have some. Let's see. Um, Okay, so Casey Dant asks, will you have Ron Reagan Jr. on your show? I love that commercial. That's how I found out about your group. And that's a, that's a common, uh, common story. So Casey, thank you and, and welcome. Uh, you are not alone in, uh, in seeing the Ron Reagan ad that we read, ran during the Democratic debate and some other, uh, other spots and, uh, and joining. So any plans to have Ron so on the show? So it looks like there's a good chance we will... We will go to him. There's a good chance that's going to happen, but we cannot announce it yet. So uh, he does, he is talking about maybe redoing that ad because there are some stations uh, that will not air that ad of Ron Reagan where he says, uh, unabashed atheists not afraid of burning in hell. Some stations won't run it and some networks won't run it. So we're thinking of going to Seattle where he is and redoing the ad. And so there's a good chance that we'll have him on Free Thought Matters. So is he going to say, afraid of burning in hell, would that be okay to run? <laughs> I mean, he came up with that line himself. We didn't write that for him. Uh. So he's thinking about, okay, what else can I say? So he's really a sport, and he's really with us, and he really cares, and he understands the, the danger of religion. Mm -hmm. And don't call him Ronald. His name is Ron. <laughs> Ron Reagan. He's the son. So. Right. So stay tuned, and uh, you'll, you can watch for that. Okay, Rosie Wilson asks, if you could pick one person to interview on your TV show, dead or alive, who would you pick? Well, the first thing that came to my mind is Darwin. Mm. I would love to sit down with Charles Darwin. Pretend like you're Darwin, all right? White, whiten your beard a little bit. Yeah, and, and lengthen it. <laughs> and say, by the way, Darwin, you were right, and science has confirmed it in the decades and the centuries since then. And by the way, You'd love to know about genetics. You'd love to know about the DNA molecule, wouldn't you? You were right. You knew there was something happening there from generation to generation. Well, now we know. Wouldn't it be great to talk with someone like that and just let him know how, how much? It's called Darwinism. It's your name, yeah. you know. So uh, who do you think you'd? Uh... Uh, I think I might pick Bertrand Russell, maybe. Yeah. Would love to just, uh, just be able to pick his brain and let him pontificate for as long as he was willing to on the show. Maybe Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Sure, yeah. To let her know that she proposed 
the, the amendment, the women's vote, which is 100 years this year, by the way. That's right. Let her know. She died before it became a reality. Say, thank you. She was an outspoken atheist. She worked for women's rights for 50 years. Say, Elizabeth, thank you for your work. And by the way, women got the vote, and women are making a difference, thanks to you. That's right. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Anthony... Uh, Pepitone, Pepitone, sorry, says, uh, why doesn't FFRF sue the government for permitting In God We Trust on U.S. currency and also for permitting Under God to remain as part of the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, so legal questions uh, squeezing in. Do you, do you want to field it? No, you, you, you can it? go ahead. You can talk about that one. Okay, so In God We Trust and Under God, these are, um, we, we've had shows about this. I could go on and on and on, but I'll give you the kind of the quick version of it is that the, uh, the courts have viewed these phrases as what they call ceremonial deism, which is is this legal fantasy that comes from uh, when the government has defended them, because these, these have been challenged in courts. We did it ourselves. Uh, right, yes. And, uh, and so when the government comes to, uh, the government attorneys come to defend these phrases, what they do is they tell the court, well, you know, no one believes that these are actually conveying a religious sentiment. When we say one nation under God, that's just a rote thing that we say when we say, in God we trust. No one actually means the the God that you know we the Christians think created the universe. It's just a generic statement. It's like saying in the year of our Lord. It doesn't have any religious content. So therefore, it's not endorsing a religious message. And unfortunately, courts have sort of bought that. So that's the reason it survives. And then the really frustrating thing is that, of course, in your everyday life, I'm sure you've run into uh, religious apologists will nevertheless use this as the uh, as justification for endorsing religion. They'll say, well, if, re if endorsing religion is so bad, why don't you take out the $1 bill and see what it says on there? Yeah, There's so a religious message. So they don't know that they're supposed to be playing into this fantasy that this is not religious. So we sued over In God We Trust on the money and as our national motto back in the 1990s. I think we were the third attempt in history. And uh, we never got into court. There never was a chance for the attorneys for either side to make any case. Mm -hmm. uh, the judge simply dismissed it on the grounds that, as you say, that in God we trust is not a religious phrase. Right. And so since in God we trust is not a religious phrase, the court said, uh, then there's no state church problem here because there is no religion in government. It's just a, it's just a meaning. But you're right. Uh, we can hardly complain about any issue like prayer at school board meetings or the Ten Commandments monument in front of a high school, and somebody will rip out a dollar bill. And sometimes people say to me, well, Dan, it's just a little word on a piece of paper. What's the big deal? What's the, it's just a trivial thing. Why are you so upset about it? Why, just don't look at it. Just spend the money and ignore it. And I usually reply by saying, well, if it really is that trivial, you wouldn't miss it if it were gone, Yeah. right? But of course they would miss it. It's a territorial thing. They want their mark on our government. And so uh, it really is a religious phrase with religious motive behind it. And the, the, the record, legislative record, shows that. Yep. Uh, and that's, it's prizes that we give out at every one of our conventions, right? It's clean money. So pre-In God We Trust money, you could uh, potentially win if you come to one of our, our conventions. So that's kind of nice. You could get a, you know, frame a, a $10 bill maybe that doesn't say In God We Trust. Which Before is nice. 1957. Right. Yeah. When and, it was actually put on the, on the dollar bills. It appeared on some coins occasionally. Mm -hmm. Before that time. That's right, yeah. Uh, but uh, as far as our war. currency, it, it showed up in the mid-1950s. Yeah. And again, we're uh, going over some subtleties there. So there are still fights going on to try to challenge them, but um, that's the, the kind of capital letters of what's going on there. All right. Trevor Nelson asks, could God make rock music, in parentheses, so awesome he couldn't top it? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I can I use that it. joke yeah, in a debate. Yeah. Huh. If anyone missed the joke, yet people always ask, could God make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it? So, yeah, well played. All right. Uh, hmm. Ravi uh, Bandari asks, what do you think of introducing atheism as a subject in social studies in schools? Will school districts be fine with it? Well, so um, at the college level, atheism is a part of some curriculums. And in fact, there are a few colleges that now have a department of secular studies. Mm -hmm. We've talked with Phil Zuckerman on... Um, Free Thought Matters about that. I think at Pitzer in California was the first school to have, you can actually get a degree in secular studies at the college level. And now in Austin, 
with the help of uh, an FFRF benefactor, there's now a chair, an atheist chair, a secular chair at the University of Austin. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the college level, it's one thing. Uh, if you're talking about secondary or elementary school, that would be tough. And, it, and it's because not only are teachers not supposed to promote religion, they're also not supposed to hinder it either. Right. So it would be a tough line to walk at a high school for a teacher to be able to go in and present it objective. Of course, we think it should be done. Yeah. If you're going to include religion as a part of history, you should also include the vast, wonderful contributions of non-religious people to our world as well. Yeah, but I mean, this is why we're opposed to Bible, uh, Bible classes in high schools, for instance. It's not that it couldn't be done constitutionally. And in fact, you know, many atheists who were raised religious know that a close study of the Bible is a great way to create atheists. Yeah, and right? some people said that. A.A. Oh. A. Milne, you know, who wrote Winnie the Pooh? Yeah, yeah. He, he thought it was, uh, Old Testament was responsible for more atheism, you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. If and, people would read the Bible, actually. Right. But we know in practice what's going to happen is teachers are going to get up there and they're going to teach it like a Sunday, a Sunday school where they're just going to say, here's Noah's Ark and here's the Garden of Eden and, you know, that's the class. And so then you actually are promoting religion whether you intend to or not. So I would have the same concerns about, uh, even though you, you could legally teach the history of atheism, you, you could have that, where you're not saying that atheism is correct and here's why it's correct you're just saying here's the contributions of atheists or even here's the uh, the history of the secularist movement you could teach that but i would be pretty leery at the high school level of um having th that open i think that most teachers are not going to want to have to to walk yeah. that line and they and we, we shouldn't be asking it's them hard to. enough to do at the college level yeah with really well-trained teachers. How many high school teachers would be trained enough? Um, you could see maybe, here's a list of wonderful religious people who have done these great religious things, and here's a list of non-religious. You could probably pull it off like that if you were balanced. Uh, yeah. Uh, that'd be nice. No, nothing happen. against high school teachers. I'm married to one. Uh -huh. I, they're perfectly capable of it, but they're also spread pretty thin, and they're yeah. not you know, professional scholars in this one very specific area. Yeah. So. Yeah, but a uh, good idea, really interesting question. And then, um, so we have a, a couple questions that we uh, are probably not gonna be able to specifically answer, but I will, I'll read them and tell you why. So uh, Claudia Lindstrom asks, who's the best candidate for the separation of church and state? Uh, which is a wonderful question to be asking and uh, definitely encourage people to consider state church separation when you're uh, voting and do vote, 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 vote. But with that said, uh, as a 501c3, we have limitations that include we're not allowed to endorse particular candidates or um, uh, for positively or negatively. So uh, we are not going to name any names about who we think is the, um, the best or the worst. So you're gonna have to do just a little bit of research on your own because we are uh, an apolitical organization uh, by by our nature. Yeah. So, but we can certainly ask candidates not only what they think about state church separation, but what are they doing to reach out not just to religious voters, but to reach out to us non-religious voters as well. We can certainly ask those questions. But uh, as Ryan said, FFRF can't take a position or make a recommendation. A lot of churches do that, don't yeah. they? They break the law, but we're not going to do that. That's right. All right, then uh, Danny Nicholson, we just have a couple, couple questions left. Uh, Danny Nicholson says, how do we build momentum to have political representation for anti-theists in our government? So that's an interesting question. And again, we, we can't get into endorsing particular people, but um, yeah, do you have any, any thoughts? Well, um, uh, it's already happening. Uh, when political candidates for public office run for office as an open non-believer and there's no repercussions. There's no, for example, Jared Huffman is one example. He's an outspoken non-believer in God in California. And uh, he came out as a non-believer and then in his next election, there was a question, well, would that affect the voters? He actually did better in the next election. So the voters didn't really care about his beliefs about God or non-beliefs. They cared about the issues. That's what they were voting for. So the more that happens, the easier it will be for others to maybe join the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. What mm -hmm. are there, 13 members now yeah, in that, that's right. from around the country? Mm -hmm. 
And that, that cock is then raising the profile and the acceptance of non-believers. We're starting to see that happen. I, th I think we're in the ancient history days right now. Mm -hmm. 20 years from now, you're probably going to say, yeah, I remember when there was only 13. Right. And so, yeah, they, it's uh, normalizing it, right, and kind yeah. of breaking this myth that this is political suicide to say that you're a non-believer. Yeah. And uh, kind of similar to, to Europe in a way, right? If, uh, if you imagine a couple hundred years ago, uh, it would have been maybe perhaps dangerous to your health to come out as a non-believer. And now already you have um, a totally different culture where it's completely politically acceptable to be uh, non-religious. Well, it's almost the opposite. It's almost embarrassment to be an open religious right, candidate. Right. You know? Well, and also I, the other thing I think of is there are political cliches that you hear all the time, like thoughts and prayers and other just, you know, uh, making references to religion is something that I think is going to be seen as increasingly inauthentic, especially by non-religious voters. So I think as we move into uh, an era when politicians start to realize that it's, it might actually be harmful to be putting things in religious terms all the time. Uh, and maybe instead you should be more honest. Voters might actually appreciate truth and honesty. And so that might mean calling out religion for some of its ills and not using it as this cliched positive thing. So I think that also moves, in, moves us in that direction. Or it could be that truly devout religious members of the government might want to temper their own rhetorics. And that we're not telling them they can't believe. Of Absolutely. course, they can believe and think what they want. But they might realize, well, this is a diverse, pluralistic society. And what, a, what right do I have to push my, my particular religious views on the rest of the country? Exactly. All right, so one final question for you, Dan. Uh, <clears throat> Steve Shaw asks, what is your take on the evangelical community glomming onto Trump? Ah, OK. So um, thanks, Steve. So there's been a lot written and a lot analyzed about evangelicals and Trump. About 80% of evangelicals are Trump supporters in the country. They are his base, and you see that all the time. Uh, to his credit, my born-again Christian brother, Tom, he's a great guy. He's an evangelical Christian, and he's very conservative on almost all the issues. And he and I don't talk too much, obviously, about those things. But he hates Trump. He's one of the 20% of evangelicals who think that, like I used to think when I was an evangelical, that character matters. The character of the candidate actually matters for something. Today, evangelicals think more that politics matters, that who cares what Trump's personal life is like, we like him because he's getting us what we want. Mm -hmm. And you've heard some evangelicals talk about, uh, at, that, at that big church uh, rally, when, in Florida a few weeks ago, what was that? The Jesus Light of the World Church. Something like uh, that in Miami yeah, area. I think. In Miami. The pastor got up there and, he's, and he prayed to God that Donald Trump is our Cyrus. And that kind of flew by. And uh, what did he mean when, when he said Donald Trump is our Cyrus? Well, King Cyrus in the Bible, also known as King Darius, was the, the Persian king who invaded and, and conquered Babylon at the time when ba the Babylon was holding the Jews captive. The Israelites were being held captive in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and the other leaders. So when King Cyrus came into Babylon, he didn't care about the Jews. He said, you guys can go home now. And the Jews were happy and, and you know, praising um, Darius or Cyrus, whatever his name was, because even though he was a pagan, he was not a believer. He was not a believer in the true God. King Cyrus got for the Israelites what the Israelites wanted. Wow. So for modern evangelicals to say, well, Donald Trump is our King Cyrus, it's kind of like saying, well, he's not one of us and we don't really like him. He's a pagan, but he's getting us what we want. Right. So I think, I think it's mar a, a marriage of politics rather than a real principle or Christian ideology. Yeah. Are we out of time? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, so. So thank you so much for your questions. That is our show for the week. Uh, thanks for watching and please do tune in next week, uh, next Wednesday at noon central for next week's Ask an Atheist.